two tyrannical tyrants when it comes to handheld gaming PCs, in fact the only two on the market that are currently worth buying in my opinion. Options like the GPD Win 3 and 1S Player 1X don't offer good price to performance, bang for buck, or sheer value. At 400 to 650 US dollars for the Steam Deck, and 700 dollars for the Z1 Extreme version of the ROG Ally, which is the variant we're going to be focusing on today, due to it having notably more processing power than its other version. Unlike the Steam Deck, which offers three versions, but they have the exact same processing power, graphical power, virtually all the components are the same except for the storage and that anti-glare screen. Both of these devices definitely shine in the handheld PC segment, but I will say one offers a greater value, and that same device also appeals to a broader audience, to a larger demographic of gamers, making it kind of a no-brainer recommendation. But for a substantially smaller group of gamers, you're going to get a much better gaming experience on the chunk of plastic wearing the silver medallion at the end of this comparison. Without further ado, we're going to compare both these devices on a multitude of categories, including D-pad, screen, and speakers. The video is going to be timestamped into chapters, which is reflected in the description as well as the timeline of the video for easy navigation. Sit back, enjoy. And while two pissed off combatants enter the Coliseum, only one is going to be exiting blood soaked, sweaty, and satisfied from beating the ever living shit out of its competitor. Let's get it. As for the packaging and included accessories, it will be overlaying some B-roll of the unboxing during the dedicated review of each of these devices. The actual packaging, the box itself, is prettier on the ROG Ally, as it has this white and holographic design, and the Steam Deck is basic brown cardboard. Two huge differences that need noted. First of all, you do have a 65-watt fast charger with the ROG Ally and a 45-watt fast charger with the Steam Deck. You are going to get faster charging. We'll talk about that later with the ROG Ally, which is important because the Ally has worse battery life. So a better charger with the ROG Ally, but even the entry-level $400 Steam Deck comes with a very nice carrying case, which holds any loose accessories you may have, pretty much just your charger. As where the ROG Ally has a $40 optional case on the ASUS website, but does not ship with one. Because of that, if you're ever going to take your deck on the go, you have a very nice, respectable carrying case. You don't need to shell out $20, $40 bucks on Amazon. Packaging and included accessories is going to go to the Steam Deck. Initial setup is going to go to the Steam Deck, as it takes about 30 minutes to get up and gaming in comparison to the ROG Ally, where if you properly set it up, you're looking at about two and a half to three hours as it is, in essence, a three-part setup. You're setting up the operating system of Windows 11, which you'll have to manually check for cumulative, that's a hard word, cumulative security updates to keep your PC safe from hackers and malicious assholes. Then you'll need to remove bloatware, any programs pre-installed that you don't want, install the launchers and browser you want, all of your presets and preferences, change the taskbar settings to not look so silly like Windows 11 does out of the box. Then you need to upgrade Armory Crate as well as the BIOS for your PC. And last but not least, dive into the settings of the actual PC itself itself and set up your new device. Along the way, you're probably going to run into a lot of glitches, stutters, and error messages. But if you can conquer the initial setup, you will be rewarded with some damn fun PC gaming on the go. Initial setup is absolutely going to go to the Steam Deck. As far as ergonomics and comfort, the Deck is a larger device. It's heavier, it's also notably longer, and it is a skosh thicker as well, especially if you have some kind of an aftermarket grip like I have installed. The ROG Ally just not going to feel as natural with those large sculpted haunches that the Steam Deck sports. Combine this with two uncomfortable and clumsy rear buttons on the Ally and you have a less comfortable device. It's not uncomfortable by any means. I can use this bad boy for, I was going to say hours, but unless you're plugged in, that's not the case. But I can use this thing till it's tapped out without getting hand cramps or knuckle fatigue. Pretty comfortable device, but the Steam Deck is just that much more comfortable. And right now we're just talking stock device versus stock device, but later on we'll talk about the third party aftermarket, which is also much more robust for the Steam Deck as it's been out for substantially longer, over a year. So if you're looking to add some kind of a grip, it's going to be much, much easier on the Steam Deck as currently, I haven't seen any sold for the Ally. Now, as far as the OS, the operating system, the software, as far as simplicity, getting up and running, it's absolutely going to go to the deck because it boots right into Steam OS. Now, I have to caveat this by saying you can install Steam OS on the ROG Ally, and I have yet another caveat for you. You can also install Windows 10 or 11 on the Steam Deck. But as far as how these devices are meant to be used by the manufacturer, not that you're breaking the mold or doing anything crazy or unrecommended by installing a different operating system on them, Valve has blatantly said with the Steam Deck, go for it. It's a PC, do what you want. But as far as out of the box, you are using Steam OS on the deck and you're using Windows 11 as well as a very pretty front end interface called Armory Crate SE on the Ally. Now, I did say during my ROG Ally review that it boots directly into Windows 11. And that is true. But if you start up the Ally from a cold start, meaning it's completely shut off and you turn it on, it will boot up Windows 11 and then automatically start the app Armory Crate SE. But it's just a windowed application. You can change the screen size, you can minimize it. As where the deck boots into Steam OS. 
OBS, and you have to manually switch into desktop mode, which takes a couple of seconds because you're switching into a different boot path, as opposed to the ROG Ally, where you're always in Windows 11, you just have that application, that program running, Armory Crate SE, which is a pretty front-end, user-friendly, like, experience that lets you organize and launch games, set up your button configurations, tighten up your dead zones, and works as the overall control hub for the computer. Now, SteamOS was a little bit buggy and stuttery at launch, and with patches and updates, the SteamOS build that we have currently is incredibly stable and just works. Everything from suspending and switching games, going between desktop and the SteamOS mode, everything is very fluid and very smooth. I have very minimal complaints on that front. The ROG Ally being a brand new device is having substantial issues where some users are on one BIOS version, some users are on another. The latest and greatest version that it is prompting you to upgrade to is supposedly the version that users are seeing less performance on. This is less performance in gameplay and also a more glitchy, stuttery experience when browsing, navigating Windows. And during my Ally review, I did mention several small quirky issues that I was running into during initial setup and just using the damn device that was super frustrating. The real beauty of the Ally is that since it's running on Windows 11 as opposed to Steam OS, which is a Linux-based operating system, you can install any launcher, launch any game, and you're not going to have any issues. As we're on the deck, you have the Proton compatibility layer, which is only going to allow certain Windows games to work on that Linux-based operating system. It's a pretty damn good chunk of games, but there are also several games that don't work. Another caveat or note here, you can install pretty much any launcher on the Steam Deck, and it used to be a real pain in the wiener schnitzel. However, there's a new method, and it is a much, much easier streamlined process to install all kinds of third-party launchers, GOG, Epic, Origin, on the deck. Jumping back over to the Ally, I haven't had any complaints with Windows 11 as a whole, as it is cropped to 150% scale, so icons are larger, also folders and subfolders are easier to browse and navigate, but the Armory Crate SE software is a buggy, glitchy mess. It isn't beta, but it definitely is in its early phase, and it is going to get much smoother, I predict, with patches and updates. Armory Crate SE, when it is working, is a phenomenal program. I am a big fan of it, but I will say I do like the SteamOS interface much more, and the fact that that is the default that's pre-installed that you launch right into, the deck is absolutely taking this category. Before we grab our swimmers caps and dive into the comparison of both of these displays, what are the similarities? What's the same on these two screens? Well, they're both 7-inch IPS LCD screens. That's about it. I've got a double doozy of tech specs in front of me, Steam Deck over here, the Dirty Dillweed Deck over here, and the Scratch Your Bum with 3-ply Ally over here. All right. Other than the size and type of display, they are completely different. The resolution's 800p on the deck. We've got 1080p on the Ally. The refresh rate, 60 hertz. So in essence, you can get to 60 FPS gaming. The Ally doubles that with 120 hertz. And with that additional processing power, there are certain titles that are gonna let you hit 120 hertz. The two entry levels of the deck have glossy screens screens as where there is a flat matte anti-glare screen on the top level flagship. Both of the allies have glossy displays. The maximum brightness is 400 nits on the deck as where maximum brightness is 500 nits on the ally. Both of these devices use touchscreens, although I will say it is more responsive on the ally. It is a 10 point multi-touch screen on the ally and that's saying a lot because the deck never feels unresponsive. It feels just like a tablet or modern cell phone where you touch it and it works. The ally is that much more responsive and faster. Response time isn't listed on the Steam Deck text specs. However, it is going to be seven milliseconds on the Ally, which isn't phenomenal. And this did come down to cost cutting. They did also say it would have been more expensive to get a 720p OLED screen in this device than the 1080p 120 LCD IPS screen that is in here. So OLED would have been sick for those super dark blacks and those rich, vibrant colors. The Ally still looks gorgeous, don't get me wrong. And as far as a durability standpoint, it is Gorilla Glass with DCX and Victus ratings on the Ally, as where there is no advertised IPX dust or impact ratings on the Steam Deck. So you could probably give a little bit more of a beating to the Ally before that screen cracks on you. Not telling anyone to go out there and do a durability test, but if you do, send me the footage. I want to see it. And last but not least, the Ally does support FreeSync Premium as well as VRR or very variable refresh rate. So I just threw a lot of tech specs at you, a lot of numbers, but as far as the actual user experience, it is a notable difference. The Ally screen looks substantially better. The jump in resolution from 800p to 1080p on a 7-inch display is noticeable. And both these PCs do have pretty noticeable black bezels around the outside of the screens. Every single aspect of the Ally screen just absolutely defecates all over the deck. The screen category is dominated by the Ally. As for built-in audio, both of these devices do have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack as well as Bluetooth support for wireless headsets, and they do have front-facing stereo speakers. The deck sounds okay. I never really had any complaints in the audio department until I listened to the Ally. If I share my screen for just a second, we can see the actual tech spec breakout over here. AI noise-canceling technology, Dolby Atmos, and a two-speaker system with smart amplifier technology.
technology. What does all that mean? Like I mentioned during my review of the Ally, these speakers get louder than I would ever want the internal speakers to be. They were freakishly loud, and even at maximum volume, they never got distorted. They were crisp. I did want just a little bit more bass or low end, but that's expected with small drivers or speakers. Absolutely blown away with the Ally's built-in speakers. You know who the victor is. As for thumbsticks, this is handled quite differently. The deck has capacitive touch sensors, which are basically proximity sensors. So when you rest your thumb on there, you can activate the gyroscope or motion aiming. Personally, I've dabbled with this feature, but I always end up turning it off. And because of that, I install my own thumbstick caps. Control freaks, unfortunately, do not fit on this device, but there are third-party universal options, which I covered during my Steam Deck accessory video. However, on the Ally, this simply isn't necessary because you have some very grippy rubber silicone compound right out of the gate, unlike the Steam Deck, which in my opinion was very slippery. You're getting about the same range of motion or same travel, and both of these feel like full-size thumbsticks. The Ally is noticeably rougher around the outside of the thumbstick gates when you're at full lock, but clicking down L3 and R3 or pushing in the analog sticks is much quieter and secure on the Ally. You do also have LED RGB lights around the outside of the thumbsticks, which you can modify or turn off in the Armory Crate software. I do recommend turning it off to save battery life. Also, at its lowest setting of 33%, it's still very bright. The biggest difference in thumbsticks between the deck and the Ally is going to be the dead zones I didn't mention during my Ally video. As soon as you provide inputs, your movements are being registered. Make sure if you're playing a modern title, you do go into the settings of that game and bump down your dead zones to the lowest possible value before your character starts moving on screen when you're not touching the thumbsticks. But something that left a very bitter taste in my mouth is the fact that I did have out of the box stick drift on the left thumbstick with my ROG ally. It was still playable by bumping up the dead zone to around 25%, but I have since gotten a replacement unit. I'm going to have to give it to the deck because I know a lot of gamers love those proximity sensors so they can use that gyroscope motion aiming. And if you don't use that feature and you don't like the way the stock deck thumbsticks feel, you can always add third party caps. I'm going to have to give it to the deck. As for the D-pad or direction buttons, I might be the only reviewer in existence that is liking the allies D-pad over the deck. The deck uses a traditional four point D-pad. I primarily don't like the placement of it because it is directly to the left of the left thumbstick. So you're over here on your left analog stick and then boom, your D-pad's right over there. It looks silly, but in practice, it works just fine. You know what works even better, IMO, in, or in my personal opinion, is the ally over here. Other than the fact it's glossy, which I hate because it collects fingerprints and micro scratches. I do like the shape though. It is a hybrid, so you have a typical four point as well as a wheel. It's more of a wheel than a four point. But I've had no issues playing some retro platformers as well as modern games where I'm just swapping through weapons and whatnot. No complaints with this D-pad. In fact, I think it feels really good and I like the placement being down and to the right of the left analog stick. It's going to go to the ally for me. As for the face or action buttons, the deck buttons are fine. They get the job done. I've had no complaints with them. But I do greatly prefer the ally, not only cosmetically as it is the color and font of Jesus, which I think looks really cool, but they're also flatter buttons, which I think feels physically better on my thumbs. They're also larger and spaced out a little bit more. But a huge quality control issue that needs mentioned is a lot of reviewers were saying, hey, my face buttons are getting stuck in, jammed to the high C's every time I press them in. This could happen with a full size controller because they are a membrane switch. You have a rubber plunger mechanism underneath the front shell, and sometimes when you stick them in, they just don't pop back. They get stuck in. One of the many reasons that I prefer mechanical switches in my controllers. That, and they're rated for millions of clicks, and they feel better, faster to actuate, and you know, all that other stuff. And, and just personal preference, I think they feel better. I haven't had any quality control issues with either of these face buttons, either of these devices face buttons, I should say, getting stuck in, jammed in, or not actuating when I press them. But I definitely do prefer the looks and feel of the Allies face buttons because of that, you know where the victor is. The bumpers look and press completely different on both these devices. The deck is almost flush, as where the Ally sticks off by about a quarter inch. The Steam Deck is also completely smooth, as where the Ally has some stippling or texturing, which doesn't provide much grip, pretty much just for cosmetics. Worked for me when I wanted them to. You know, the bumpers be bumping people off. They're doing what they should. It's a draw. It's a drawbridge. As for the triggers, because I'm sure somebody's triggered by the fact that there was a draw on the last category, don't get too triggered, because this was also almost a draw, but it's going to go to the ROG Ally. You have just a little bit more resistance, or perceived resistance. I don't know if there's actually more pounds per square inch to move these triggers, but it does feel like it. And they have a nice linear buttery squeeze, which the Steam Deck does too. I just happen to like these a little bit more. I'm going to give the triggers to the ally. As for the rear buttons, I have an entire video praising the rear buttons of the Steam Deck that I put out about two weeks after getting that device because they are so damned good. They're almost flush with the rear shell, making them incredibly comfortable where you just want to naturally grip the deck. Those rear buttons are resting, but they're not in your way either. And best of all, you can actually depress them or actuate them in two different spots, either pressing down on the rear shell or squeezing towards your palms. I've actually never seen that design of rear buttons on a controller or handheld before. The ROG Allies rear buttons are incredibly clumsy. They're larger than 
they need to be. They're also much higher than they should be. And from a durability standpoint, it'd be kind of silly to get your finger up underneath here. But if you did and gave it a good tug, you could break these off. As with the Steam Deck buttons are virtually impossible to break. You'd have to do something real silly. Both these devices do allow you to rebind the rear buttons on the fly. I will say the Steam Deck does hold its bindings better. The ROG Ally would lose its bindings several times and I'd have to rebind them, which was very frustrating. I am proud to say that has now been fixed to where the rear button bindings stay when you bind them. However, you have to do it through the game profile in Armory Crate. If you try and suspend the game mid-game and then just do it uh, nilly-willy, it's not going to stick. You need to do it through the Armory Crate game profile. I'll have a little tutorial in the near future. The Allies' rear buttons are slightly growing on me. I'm liking them more as I play with them, but they're still nowhere near the Steam Deck, not even in the same league, not even playing the same game. It's going to go to the deck all day. As for ports, plugs, and controls, you do have a micro SD card slot to be able to expand the storage on both these devices. You are going to be limited to UHS 1 speeds on the deck, but you can hit UHS 2 speeds on the Ally. One thing to note, you're not really going to find capacities higher than 128 gigabyte currently. Not to mention, there just really isn't that many options out there that exist. But over time, in the future, there will be more popping up, and the Ally is more future-proof in that aspect, being rated for UHS 2 speeds. Controls are overall the same. You have two control buttons on each, one for a hardware submenu and one for a software submenu. That's going to be your Steam button and your Armory Crate button and then the control center slash valve button. There is a proprietary port on the top of the Ally, which does allow you to buy a $2,000 external GPU, which also makes the device not portable because you have to be tethered to wall power and probably creates a nasty CPU bottleneck, but... Uh, it has that option for you. The deck has a more practical extra control, and that is going to be the two touchpads. We saw it on the Steam controller, and then it was updated and implemented on the deck, and they work very good. Whether you use them for aiming and shooters, or you're using them for games that would usually use a mouse, like an RTS, a real-time strategy game. For Rickon, awesome. And you can always bind those touchpads to whatever you want, so if you want them to work like an extra D-pad, you could do that as well. That opens up the door to a whole genre of games that would usually only be playable with a mouse, and overall, having those capacities of touch sensors, the gyroscope motion aiming, the dual touch pads, the four rear buttons, ports, plugs, and controls has to go to the deck. Now as for processing power, the CPU, the GPU, the RAM, what you're actually going to experience in game, there's no denying it, the Ally is a more powerful device. It came out a year later, it's using Zen 4, not Zen 2 architecture, it's on RDNA 3, not RDNA 2, and the little GPU on the Ally can ramp up to 8.6 teraflop as you're only getting 1.6 teraflops on the deck. That's a huge difference. Both devices do have 16 gigabytes of LP DDR5 RAM. However, that's 5,500 MTs on the deck and 6,000 something on the Ally. It's, it's on screen right here. Now, both these devices are powered by AMD, a custom APU in the deck, and the Ryzen Z1 Extreme processor inside of the ROG Ally. I could make an entire 45 minute video going over just the gaming performance of these two devices, comparing multiple games, going over tips and tricks and lessons learned on these two devices, but I'm going to try and summarize a lot of that right here, right now. Unlike the deck, the Ally actually actually gets quite a bit better performance, about 15% better performance when plugged into wall power, because the TDP limit jumps up by 5, which in practice can get around 8 to 10. I will say if you do everything right for the Ally with that Z1 Extreme and the stars align, you do get about 30 to 40% more performance than the deck. However, that is in certain use case scenarios, in certain games, in certain settings. But there simply is no denying it that the Ally is quite a bit damn more powerful. Gaming performance has to go to the Ally, whether you're playing it docked, using PC peripherals, a keyboard and mouse, or you're playing it portable, you are still going to get better performance out of that ally. Also, the more time I spend gaming on the ally, the more apparent that performance gap or difference between the deck becomes. It is definitely a more powerful device. Now, as far as battery life, we got bad and worse over here. Both of these sport a 40 watt hour battery. You're getting two to eight hours of advertised gameplay on the deck, and they're not going to mention it on the ally because less than one hour of gameplay isn't really a selling feature. You did hear me correctly. If you're playing AAA titles, maxed out frame rate on the deck, you're looking at about two hours of battery life. However, you can kill the ally in under an hour, which is insane. Now, as these are handheld PCs, there are a ton of fangs that you can do to squeeze out more battery life, such as dropping the resolution to 720. 20p or tapering back the refresh rate from 120 to 60 or staying out of turbo and performance mode and using silent good luck if you're playing anything other than like retro platformers uh, silent is pretty much just for browsing the interface but you can create your own custom tdp or power profiles your own custom presets if you will but there is no denying the battery life is the achilles heel of both these devices they are both very powerful handheld pcs that offer kick-ass triple a gaming on the go there has to be some sacrifices made somewhere and it's going to be in battery life but the deck having 
pretty much double the ally's battery life, it's going to go to the deck. However, that point pretty much evens right back out and ties because the ROG ally has substantially faster charging, pretty much double the speeds. If you're not playing on the ally just charging, you can go from 0 to 100 in about an hour and 15 minutes, and 30 to 45 minutes will get you a half charge. So much like cell phones that have really subpar battery life but offer ridiculously fast charging, it's kind of a give and take. I mean, would you rather have more battery life but have to sit there and charge for longer, or do you want it just dying all the time but it doesn't take very long to get it juiced back up? Both those options sound stinky to me. I would prefer we just had just killer battery life. It's not the world we live in. Battery life goes to the Steam Deck. Charge time goes to the Ally. As for the heat and noise, as much as you wanted me to bust out my laser thermometer, which I was strongly inclined to do until I found out the batteries were dead and I didn't have any of those tiny watch batteries to replace it, I'm going to tell you right now the ROG Ally is noticeably quieter. The Steam Deck, when she's working overtime, she's down there in the coal mines, filling up the burners to fuel your gameplay. The heat definitely ramps up. Both these devices have fans that pull double duty. They're intake and exhaust fans, exactly like the PlayStation 5. So it intakes from those grates in the back and then expels or exhausts the hot air up the top. Neither device gets hot where you're just holding it. However, if you're going to hold your hand in front of the exhaust vent, yes, you're going to feel some physical discomfort. It's going to be blowing some hot ass air on your hands. It's not going to scald your fingertips off or anything, but it's not going to be an enjoyable experience for you. Luckily, where you just want to naturally hold these devices, all the hot air is missing me. And in silent and performance mode, the device is pretty much silent. However, in turbo, it does start making a little bit of a noise, but it's not freakishly loud and it's definitely quieter than the Steam Deck. Thermals and noise is going to go to the Ally. Now, as far as storage on the Steam Deck, you do have some options. You have the 64 gigabyte entry level model, which is slower memory. It's eMMC. Then you have a 256 gigabyte NVMe SSD and a 512 gigabyte NVMe SSD, which is rated for faster speeds. Now, this is the 512 gigabyte flagship deck, and this is the, well, only storage option for the ROG Ally, but the Z1 Extreme over here, which also comes with 512 gigabytes of space, which let me proclaim, you probably already watched my Ally video and I said the exact same thing, 512 gigabytes of space is not enough with these handheld PCs in 2023 because they're nothing like a Switch where the game files are incredibly small and then compressed even further from there, and if you get the physical SD cards, all the game files are on there, you're just storing your save game files in your internal Switch storage. But the deck and Ally are handheld PCs, so you're installing full-size PC game files. We're talking about 120 plus gigs for Forza Horizon, Modern Warfare 2, that's well over 100 gigs as well. You install a couple of modern flagships and you are tapped out with that NVMe SSD storage, and then you're looking at expanding into micro SD storage, which is notably slower. Is it detrimental? Is it going to make it to where you can't AAA game? No, that was a concern when the deck launched, and we've come to find out over the last year that simply isn't the case, but it does load slower. Load times in your game are going to be noticeably slower. So I do recommend prioritizing your modern AAA titles to the internal storage, and then your older games or retro emulation to the micro SD card. Now, both of these manufacturers do allow you to do a partial disassembly or teardown of the PC and replace the NVMe with your own storage. So if you want to increase the capacity or install a drive with faster read and write speeds, you can do that. Both the manufacturers have recommended that you don't do this. It will indeed void your warranty. It's neat that the deck offers three options and sizes and capacity, but uh, it's still going to be a draw for me because at the flagship of 512 gigabytes for the internal NVMe storage, that is not enough. They're computers. Imagine building a computer in 2023 and then only installing 512 gigs of storage. You probably wouldn't do it. Now, as far as the third party aftermarket of accessories, it is littered on the deck side of the house because prior to that device even launching, there was such anticipation and hype around it that Amazon was just littered with a slew of docks and cases and grips and thumbstick caps and screen protectors. How those are even being sold, I don't know because they all come with a carrying case. Maybe you want two carrying cases. Double down. Asus does have an accessory section on the landing page for the ROG Ally, and all the accessories being shown here are indeed Asus products such as their headset and their controller. But as far as the deck, you have the licensed dock from Valve. You also have a slew of third-party accessories. However, I'd be careful navigating that minefield because there are a lot of really crappy products out there. But to help you out a little bit, there is linked in the description below a Steam Deck accessory guide I put together about a month ago. Incredibly useful video if you're looking to pick up anything for your Steam Deck. Aftermarket goes to the deck. Yes, the Ally does have that external GPU, but I'm not even I'm not even considering that as a factor because it's wildly impractical. Next up, hopefully you never need to activate it, but we've got to talk about the warranty. Both of these hold the same periodic length of a one-year warranty. However, I will say from all the stories I've heard, Valve seems to honor the warranty for their hardware, whether that's the Valve controller or the Valve Index or the Steam Link or whatever, good about getting replacements sent out quite quickly. As were me just trying to find the warranty period for 
for the ally on the Asus website for that review. Quite a chore. I had out of the box dick drift with mine and I just applied through a refund through Best Buy, which is the only authorized vendor for the ally. You're either going to get it through Asus or you're going to get it at Best Buy. I got it delivered to my house via Best Buy, applied for a refund on the busted one, got a new one sent out in two days. So that was actually super easy. But yeah, one year warranty for both of these. It's a draw. No, it's not. It's going to go to the deck because we all know, we all know that Lord Gaben and the good fine people over there at Valve care more about the gamers than the Republic of Gamers. So we've talked about the individual components, the screen, the speakers, the storage. Which one's the dealio? Which one do I pick up if I can only buy one device? First of all, if you're on any kind of a budget, I recommend getting the $400 eMMC storage version of the Steam Deck. Then getting yourself a 512 gigabyte micro SD from Amazon. I'll have a good budget one that doesn't suck meat linked in the description below. Slap that in the took us your deck and you're good. Having said that, if you've owned the deck for about a year and you're craving a little bit more performance when you're playing those AAA titles, the Ally for sure is going to deliver that for you. You got to figure out what you're going to do with your deck. Are you going to keep it? Are you going to trade it in? Are you going to have an Ally and a deck? The Ally is truly the only handheld PC that I think even holds a candle to the deck, but I still have to recommend the deck to most gamers, to most eyeballs watching this video. It's a much more user-friendly experience as you boot right into Steam OS, which is a very user-friendly experience, console-like if you well, it's like a switch, but it is still a gaming PC. So you can take it into desktop mode, install different launchers, even dock it and use peripherals like a keyboard and mouse and do some basic productivity work. The Ally is about 15 to 30% more powerful again in the right games and the right use case scenarios. The Steam Deck is still going to get my recommendation and it's still the victor in this video because it has done something that the Ally and no other handheld PC has done. And that is truly bridge the gap between consoles and gaming PCs. I have never ever witnessed a device or apparatus, a consumer electronic item, do what the Steam Deck has done. Things like the GPD Win 3, which are $1,300, performed quite a bit worse than the Steam Deck and were a bitch to browse, worse than the Ally, and that's still on Windows. Just the controls on that thing were terrible. As of making this video, the only two handheld PCs worth buying are going to be the ROG Ally and the Steam Deck. But if I could only own one, it would be the Steam Deck, the old Cleveland Steamer. Don't look that up in Urban Dictionary, you know, it's a nickname for the Steam Deck. That's all you need to know. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. This was just my opinion. Drop in the comment section below your opinion of the Ally and the Steam Deck. And let me know what you're doing your handheld gaming on. Is it a Switch? Is it a Game Boy? Is it a PS Vita that's been jailbroken? I want to hear about it. Some of the products and other videos I've mentioned throughout this video are going to be linked in the description below. So check that out and I'll see you stallions and stallionettes tomorrow. Peace. If you enjoyed the video, liking it helps it to get seen by more gamers. This information will reach in a system as well, which in turn helps me grow this little channel, which I do greatly appreciate. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover news in the gaming community and industry, tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing, as well as honest gaming product reviews, keyboards, mice, headsets, controllers, mics, chairs, etc. There are some hefty exclusive discount codes found only in the description of my videos and only for the audience here at Gamer Heaven. I have links to all my other platforms and socials in the description below to get in touch with myself and the stallions and stallionettes of gamer heaven join the community discord and check me out at twitch.tv where i go live every other leap year on a blue moon if it falls into an odd calendar number and my ph balance is on point just kidding starting june i'm going to be live streaming a lot thanks for watching this has been ak40 kevin hosting gamer heaven and i'll see you tomorrow because i upload daily all the time 60 percent of the time sometimes most of the time peace